Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Mark 5, verses 1 through 20. They came to the other side of the lake, to the country of the Gerizines. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when Jesus, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went out and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. I think you can do better than that. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you all today uh, to learn with you from God's Word. In case you don't know me, uh, my name is Dave Bryan. Um, I am a double graduate of TEDS with an MDiv and a PhD focusing on New Testament. And I now work just around the corner in the Dean's office as the Master's Programs Coordinator. So I'm excited to be here with you all uh, this morning. Before we begin and look at this text, uh, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise uh, that you are God, that you are indeed mighty to save. We ask that you would help us this morning uh, open our hearts and our minds and our ears um, to hear what we need to hear this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, after I uh, completed my MDiv in uh, 2006, a very long time ago it feels, um, my wife and I agreed to serve on a church planning team in Madrid, Spain. And so we spent the next year or so uh, raising support and uh, going downtown uh, Chicago to 
apply for our visas at the Spanish consulate. We were living over in Highland Park at the time. And uh, after about a year, uh, the summer of 2007, our lease was up in Highland Park and we were finishing up support raising and waiting for our visas. And so we moved to North Carolina with my parents uh, to live with them in preparation to go to Madrid. And uh, mid-October rolled around and we finally heard from the Spanish government that my visa had been approved uh, and that I had 90 days from that point to be in country. Otherwise, the visa would expire, be void. Unfortunately, uh, Beth, my wife, her visa, there was no news at all about her visa. Uh, it was lost in Spanish bureaucracy. And so we said, okay, you know, we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, we uh, prayed and waited and we made plans uh, because of my 90-day deadline. We bought tickets for both of us to fly out on January 9th uh, to Madrid in hope, uh, hope that her visa would come. Eventually, January rolls around, and still no news from the Spanish government. And so we decided that I was going to have to fly to Madrid alone, uh, because otherwise uh, my visa would expire and I'd have to start the process all over again, uh, which would have taken forever, as we learned. Um, anyways, and so uh, January 7th, so two days before I was supposed to fly out, I did what any person who is leaving their home country would do, I went surfing. Uh, my parents, we were living with them in North Carolina. It was a beautiful January day in North Carolina. You can say that in North Carolina because it's still warm. And so I drove to the coast. I had a great day of surf. It was wonderful. And I got out of the water and I checked my phone and I had about a dozen missed messages uh, from Beth. And so I called I said, what's up? And she said, I'm on my way to the airport because the Spanish consulate called and my visa has been approved. And so Beth was on her way to the airport. She flew from Raleigh to Chicago. And the next morning, she picked up her visa at the consulate here in Chicago, flew back that night. And the next day on January 9th, uh, both of us flew together to begin ministering in Madrid. After recording Jesus' preaching and teaching in Mark 4, 1 to 34, Mark shifts his narrative uh, in 435 to uh, 543 to a series of encounters with various people in need. In 435 to 41, you find the disciples in a storm uh, tossed boat. In 5, 1 to 20, Jesus meets a man who is possessed by an unclean spirit. In 521 to 43, you find uh, Jesus meets Jairus, whose daughter is on the verge of death, and a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. In each of these texts, Jesus encounters people who are experiencing a, a situation out of their control. They are helpless to change their circumstances much like Beth and I were waiting a very long time for our visas. And in order to tease out what exactly Mark is narrating about Jesus and us in these texts, I want to explore three uh, things. I want to talk about what it reminds us, what it assures us, and how we are to respond in return. I'm going to spend the bulk of our time looking at 5, 1 to 20, but I will uh, we'll occasionally look at the other texts in this section of Mark's gospel that Taylor has so graciously given me a lot of text to deal with. Um, now, as I mentioned, each of these texts deals with people, uh, human beings in difficult circumstances. In 5, 1 to 20, Jesus has just crossed over the Sea of Galilee and disembarked in the country of the Gerasenes when he's met by a man with an unclean spirit and dealing with uh, demons or unclean spirits uh, is pretty commonplace early on in Jesus' ministry. So it's not terribly unusual that Jesus meets such a man in Mark 5. But what is really unusual in this passage 
is the lengthy description that is given about the man. And I think it really draws the hearer's attention to the man's situation. Look at verses 2 through 5. Mark tells us that the man is more or less captive to or controlled by the unclean spirit. He's alone and alienated from society. He is dwelling, if we could call it that, in the tombs, in the mountains. He is uh, harming himself and he is crying out night and day. In effect, he's helpless against the unclean spirit. And so too were anyone, any other human beings who tried to help him. They tried to bind him, but they, no one was strong enough to subdue him, as it says in verse 4. In fact, in 5, 1 to 13, the man is virtually non-existent. It is the unclean spirit who leads the man to greet Jesus. It is the unclean spirit who greets Jesus and dialogues with him and petitions him. The man does nothing in 5, 1 to 13. He has lost control over even his own life. Note also that it's important to note that none of these situations that we find in this section of Mark's gospel and in here in 5, 1 to 20, none of them are caused by sin. Mark instead repeatedly reminds us here is that humanity is subject to a world that is out of control, that is broken in a need of renewal. Storms endanger the lives of Jesus and his disciples. Demons exist and they torment and control human beings. Death is a very real and very terrible aspect of human existence. Chronic illness and suffering are a part of life. And in none of these situations does Mark narrate that the people experiencing these things are the cause, due to their sin, of their situations. The situation of the demon-possessed man, along with the other examples here in Mark 4.35 to 5.43, reminds us that we as human beings, we dwell helplessly with the uncontrollable. As human beings, we are not in control because there is so much that is outside of our control. The world is filled with human beings dealing with situations that are painful, traumatizing, unfathomable, and often we are not able to control or change them. Some of you may have seen the movie um, 50-50, or 50 slash 50. In the movie, Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays a man named Adam, and Adam is that type of person Um, that doesn't like to risk anything. Uh, To the point that on an early morning jog in the wee hours of the morning, when he comes to a crosswalk, empty street, he stops at the crosswalk and waits for the sign, the crosswalk sign, to change and tell him to cross the street, right? That's the kind of person Adam is. And yet, despite this sort of meticulous caution, um, Adam discovers that he Uh, has a rare form of cancer in his spine. And the movie, you know, shows, portrays Adam's journey, uh, dealing with this knowledge and uh, how he responds to it. And eventually it comes to the point that Adam needs uh, needs surgery to uh, remove the cancer. It's a very risky, life-threatening, potentially life-threatening surgery. And uh, on the eve of the, the surgery... Adam, who, again, uh, doesn't want to deal with danger, right? Uh, So he doesn't have a driver's license because driving cars is really dangerous. Um, Adam decides on the eve of this surgery that he wants to drive a car. So he talks to his buddy uh, named Kyle, played by Seth Rogen, 
And uh, he gets in the car, uh, his buddy uh, lets him drive his car without a driver's license, who cares, right? Um, and so they go on a drive. And Adam uh, begins to drive and he drives a little faster and a little faster, a little wilder, a little crazier. And Seth Rogen, his buddy is in the passenger seat, sort of scared out of his mind eventually. When all of a sudden Adam slams on the brakes, almost in the middle of an intersection, and he yells at his buddy to get out of the car. And his buddy, already scared out of his mind, gets out of the car. And Adam closes the door and he locks the door. And in that moment, you begin to see the, the anguish and the anger and the fear come on his face. He is coming to grips with the, the turmoil, the emotional turmoil and fear that he is feeling to the point that he is eventually he's gripping the steering wheel and he's screaming at the top of his lungs because he realizes that this might be the last night of his young life. Some of us have endured the, the helplessness, the um, lack of control that is evident in the demon-possessed man or in Adam in the car. Some of us haven't had times or moments like that. But we can all, all of us live in a world in which there is so much that is outside of our control. We don't control whether we get really sick during finals week. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, we don't control the sudden loss of a friend or colleague. We don't control the major unexpected expense needed to fix the only car, the only transportation that we have. We could go on and on, each of us, about the ways in which we live on a daily basis with things that are outside of our control. And each of these passages points to this uncontrollable reality in which we all find ourselves. And there are any number of things that we could learn, about, learn from it. But what I want us to, to see this morning uh, and really grasp is the need to lament our dwelling amidst the uncontrollable. Lament is an honest, humble acknowledgement and cry out to God that the world is broken and we are in need of help. Mark's lengthy uh, description of the man's terrible, painful, suffering, helpless condition reminds us of our own terrible, helpless, painful, suffering moments that we have to live through because we can't control them. Mark reminds us that it is good and right and appropriate to lament, to grieve, to mourn that the world is not right. Many of you are, are studying for ministry or are in ministry. Let me encourage you, lament. Show the people in your churches what it means to lament, to acknowledge that you are weak and dependent and needy. Because when you acknowledge that you are weak and needy and dependent, the people in your churches feel the freedom to do the same. To come together and lament that we live amidst uncontrollable circumstances at times. And it's good and right to lament and lament together. The second thing that I want us to see in this text is that despite our helplessness uh, amidst uncontrollable circumstances, the authority of Jesus assures us 
that the uncontrollable will mercifully be reordered. The authority of Jesus assures us that mercy will be given to the helpless. Mark's account of uh, Jesus and the demoniac here in the region of the Gerasenes is the longest dialogue between Jesus and a demon in Mark's gospel. And this lengthy dialogue reveals several key things about Jesus and his authority. Just as in uh, Capernaum in Mark 1, the unclean spirit is aware of, very aware of who Jesus is. He says here uh, that Jesus is, he recognizes that Jesus is the son of God, the most high, and that Jesus has the authority to uh, torment uh, the demon. And in verse 10, the demon clarifies its potential torment by begging Jesus earnestly to not send them out of the country. So the demon in this passage recognizes that Jesus has the authority to send him out of the man, to send him out of the region. He doesn't question the authority of Jesus. He simply begs Jesus not to do what Jesus is telling him to do. And if you look at verse 9, we see also in the dialogue that um, demons have names. Uh, there's a lot of demonic encounters in the Gospels, not many of them. In fact, I think this might be the only one uh, in which the demon has a name. Uh, but it's very common in other ancient texts to see demons having names. And I think it's significant here that to Jesus' question about his name, the, de- the Spirit says, My name is Legion, for we are many. And the word legion is a clear allusion to the Roman army, uh, which consisted of legions of soldiers. A Roman legion uh, usually numbered something like five or 6,000 infantrymen and 100 to 120 cavalrymen. Uh, Octavian, after the Battle of Actium in uh, 31 BC, at one point had 60 legions under his command. And so the name of the demon here is significant because it connotes the incredible size and military might visible uh, in the Roman army. And yet, the demon still submits to Jesus. His authority, Jesus' authority is so vast that it commands legions to depart, and it obeys. The submission of legion to Jesus effectively implies that there is nothing outside of the authority of Jesus. Jesus' authority extends to what is uncontrollable, to demons in Rome, to wind and waves, to death and illness. What is uncontrollable to humanity submits to Jesus. And what results from the expulsion of the demon is nothing less than the merciful salvation of the man. Look at verse 15. They came, that is those from the city and fields, they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man the one who had had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Shortly after this, the man, not the demon, the man who was demon-possessed, the man petitions Jesus to be with him. And Jesus responds saying, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, how he has had mercy on you. Two things are noteworthy here. First, this is the first time in Mark's gospel that mercy has been mentioned. Mercy, we could define it as the goodness or the love of God towards those who are miserable, downtrodden, helpless, regardless of whether they deserve it or not. And here is mercy is specifically identified with what the Lord has done for you. Namely, that a man 
was bound by a demon, alone, alienated from friends and family, hurting himself, helpless, but now he is none of those things. He is sitting, clothed in his right mind. The Lord has had mercy on him. The man did nothing to deserve his newfound condition. The mercy of the Lord was immeasurably great to help him and rescue him from his helpless condition. And I think the, the authority and the mercy of Jesus described in this text, it, it assures us that even if we are faced with what seems uncontrollable, whether it's because of the pressure of work or our financial situation or, or the chronic illness that just won't go away or the disease that is destroying our loved one's body, when faced with such circumstances, we know, we know that there is one who has the authority, the one who controls and commands all things. Now, let me be clear. The authority of Jesus and the mercy of Jesus does not guarantee that mercy will be given when we want it or think we need it. The woman, right? The woman in 521 to 43, she suffers for 12 years. Jairus endured his, basically the death of his daughter. Beth and I, we waited for months and months for our visas to come. There is nothing in this text that promises that mercy will be given in this life. But we have been promised new birth and new life and a new dwelling place. New, new, new. The mercy of God will be given. If, if we feel homeless now, we will have a home. If we feel alone or abandoned now, we will forever have a loving family. If we are suffering from trauma, we will experience peace. The people of God, those who follow Jesus, the one who has authority to order all things, will receive mercy when he makes all things new, when there are no more tears or groans or suffering, no more times of what feels uncontrollable. Finally, I, I want to just briefly address our response to what this text has reminded and assured us. And our response is this. We need to proclaim what the Lord of the uncontrollable has done and will do for us. Now, there are several reactions in verses 14 to 20 uh, to Jesus. Uh, you get uh, the Gerasenes who are terrified and probably angry that they lost a lot of money because of the death of 2,000 pigs. Uh, they're scared and send, uh, ask Jesus, petition him to, to leave their region. You get the, the demon-possessed man who wants to be with, with Jesus. But I want to draw, just for the sake of time, I want to draw our attention to Jesus' directions to the demon-possessed man and his response. Jesus tells the man in verse 19, Again, to go home to your friends, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you, which the man obeys. As it says in verse 20, he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis how much Jesus did for him and everyone marveled. Now, I want you to, to hear me clearly that the point uh, is not that what the man does is what we should do, that, that we should imitate the man, so to speak. Um, rather, the point that I want us to see here is that 
a proper response to the mercy that we have in Christ is to proclaim it. This passage calls us to proclaim what has been done for us in Christ and what he will do for us at the last day. There are so many in the world who are hurting and broken, poor and downtrodden, traumatized and abused. They need the message of the authority and mercy of Jesus. The authority that extends over all things. The mercy that is immeasurably great. Just as the, the formerly demon-possessed man is a living illustration to his friends and family and neighbors in Decapolis, so, so we too can be living illustrations of the mercy of God to our friends, to our family, to our neighbors. Be bold. Brothers and sisters, be bold to proclaim the mercy that you have received in Christ Jesus. Mark 5, and really all of 435 to 543, it, it, it presents us with a scene of a helpless man dwelling amidst uncontrollable circumstances, who is rescued, who is saved by Jesus and sent to proclaim what the Lord has done. What we see here is that because of the mercy that we have received in Christ, we need to proclaim the new life his authority guarantees to a broken world. As those who lack control in a broken world, all of us, we need to find comfort in the one who has authority to make things right, to prayerfully lament our suffering, to wait patiently for his mercy, whether in this life or in the life that is to come. And we need to faithfully proclaim what the Lord has done and will do for us. The authority and the mercy of Jesus, they have brought us new life. And we need to proclaim the hope and comfort of that new life to all those who are in need. May we go forth into the world to proclaim this good news this day. Amen.